Thanks to all of you for waking up early and joining us for my data today. Indeed, my name is Mikko Hyppönen, and uh, I've been working with um, data all my life, pretty much all my life, uh, for, for years and years. I, uh, I guess it all started fairly early on, but I did end up eventually to where I am today, which is working at this global and Finnish company called F-Secure. And if you know F-Secure from anything working in, in, in data and privacy, you might have heard about our Wi-Fi experiment, which we did in London four years ago, which is where we set up a free Wi-Fi hotspot for anybody to use. The only thing you had to do was to agree our license terms, which included the term of giving your firstborn child to F-Secure. And, of course, everybody clicked OK. Um, I'm really disappointed that we actually didn't go and pick up the kids, which we absolutely should have done. But when I think about how I ended up doing what I do today, which is hunting hackers, trying to protect our clients' security, and trying to protect our clients' privacy, it starts from... Well, I guess it starts from my mother. Here's data. This is a punch card. It's a punch card from 1960s. My mother went to work with the Valtion Tietokone Keskus, Finnish State Computing Center, in 1966. And back then in 1960s, this is how we store data. There's 120 bytes of data on this, on this punch card right here. Data was physical, something you would actually really touch. And around that time, in the early, well, late 60s, I was born in 1969, um, of course I had no idea of any of this. But when I was a small child, one thing that I did enjoy playing a lot was games. So this is African Tähti, made in Finland, a board game. I was playing a lot of this game with my friends. And in this game, sometimes when you reach a circle and you turn over the, the pad on it, you will find this guy. It's the robber. And whenever we would end up finding the robber, me and my friends would shout to each other that rahat tai henki, rahat tai henki. Give me your money or give me your life. And I really enjoyed playing games. And I really enjoyed listening to stories about computers as told by my mother. So it's no surprise I ended up starting programming. We got a Commodore 64 8-bit computer in 1983. Yeah, 1983. Me and my brother started programming it, and we were selling our first programs in 1986. I was 16 years old. This is Paha Juttu, a game I wrote with my brother, which is a split-screen, four-channel music, digitized audio adventure game with a parser for Finnish language. And the most, the proudest professional moment I've had in my life is that this February, this game was put into a museum. There's a game museum in Finland, in the city of Tampere. I highly recommend you to visit it, where you can play lots of different games, including African Tähti, the board game, but also lots of digital games, including, of course, all the big Finnish games from today, like Angry Birds and Clash of Clans, but it also has a whole archive of old games. And my game is included there, or me and my brother's game is included in the, in the archive. So, if I was selling my first programs when I was 16 years old, I guess it's no surprise I ended up working in the field as well. In 1991, when I was 21 years old, this tall guy who was a student at Helsinki University of Technology hired me to join his startup, a company called Data Fellows. And the student was a guy called Risto Silasma, who nowadays is... Well, he's still today the chairman of F-Secure, but he's also the chairman of, of Nokia. And that's been a pretty wild ride ever since. Because when I started working with, with um, Data Fellows, which later renamed itself from Data Fellows to F-Secure, um, we 
we were working in a different world. So I had a punch card in my pocket. Another thing I have in my pocket, which I always carry around, is this. This is what I used to do when I joined the company, where I still work today. I used to analyze and reverse engineer malware, viruses spreading on floppy disks, because this was the problem we had. Malware and other malicious software was not spreading on the internet, because there was no internet. Well, TCP IP existed as a protocol, but you know, there was no web. Web came around a bit later. I know, because I set up the first website for our company in April 1996. Uh, no, 1994. April 1994. And when I set up the first website for our company, there were 15 websites in Finland before us. We were website number 16. I can show you the website. Here we go. Pretty nice, I think. <laughs> I made the graphics myself. <laughs> but it was a different world. And I, I, I remember how we realized that, holy hell, now the world is going to change. Because yes, the internet had been around already for a while. We were all, all, uh, all of us were using email, we were using FTP, some of us were using Gopher. But now we got this web. And the difference was that this was easy to use. I mean, you could use your mouse, you could click on things, there were links. I mean, anybody could use this. Anybody. My grandmother could use this. So we realized that this is going to become a big thing. This is going to become popular. Normal people will start using computers. Like, normal people will start using computers. Which was a groundbreaking idea. Because until then, everybody who had a computer in their home was a geek or a nerd. Normal people didn't have computers. And of course, today you walk around, everybody, whether they're normal or not, have a computer in their pocket. So we, we sat around with the guys in the lab. We were discussing that, well, what's going to happen now? Like, this is going to become popular. Everybody will be having access to the web. So I guess we'll have a lot of websites. There's going to be a lot of sites. A lot of services online. I don't know, there might be, who knows, there might be books on the internet one day. There might be sites where you could check the weather. There might be movies. Ooh, that would be cool. There might be, I don't know, news and articles. But then, one of us said that, okay, if that's going to happen, um, how are we going to pay for it? Like, how are the consumers going to be paying for the content? Obviously, newspapers won't just move the content they create from the paper model to the web model for free. The consumers have to be able to pay, otherwise it's not going to happen. If there's going to be weather reports on this new World Wide Web, how are the consumers going to pay for the weather reports? It costs money to create the weather reports, and we had no idea. So what we thought was that these browsers, these things, these products you use to access the web, browsers like Netscape, we assumed that these browsers will implement some sort of a payment button, some sort of a payment mechanism. We assumed that there's going to be a button on top of the browser where you could pay for what you're consuming. I'd like to read this article. Click, here's two cents. And then you can read the article. I'd like to have a chuckle to today's Dilbert comic strip. Here's half a cent. Click, and then you can read today's Dilbert. That was 1994. 24 years later, we still don't have the button. 24 years, 24 years later, we still don't have a way of doing micropayment transactions to pay for the content we consume. And instead of getting a way of actually paying for the content we consume, we ended up with a completely different mechanism for paying for content, which is tracking the users and selling that data for money. 
This is how the largest companies in Silicon Valley, almost all of the largest companies in Silicon Valley make their billions. And this turned out to be massively profitable, as we all know. This is how Google makes its money, or LinkedIn, or Twitter, or Facebook, or any of the other companies. And of course, Facebook has been a lot in the news this year for the problems they've had by collecting and selling users' data. I guess my favorite detail about all of this is the interview that BBC did with Mark Zuckerberg six years ago, now seven years ago, I guess, asking the key question, so who is going to own the Facebook content? And Mark Zuckerberg, without missing a beat, it's the user's information, users own it. You won't sell the information? Absolutely not. <sighs> Which is bullshit, as, we, as we've since seen. One thing I recommend to people to do whenever we end up speaking about the, the money-making logistics of free services online, the thing I recommend to people is that they would, for once, go to their favorite social media site or favorite free cloud storage platform or favorite free search engine and for once, use those services, not as a consumer, but as a client, as a paying client, which of course means going to these services and buying an ad. Because when you go to these services and you buy an ad and you pay money for the ad, then you are the customer of the service. And then you actually see how it works. And this is eye-opening. For example, when you go to Twitter, and buy an ad on Twitter, which means buying a promoted tweet, then you get to see their targeting engine where you can select who will see your ad, where in the world they are, whether they are male or female, whether they are seeing your tweets, your promoted tweets, with a computer, with an iPhone, with an Android, with Mac, with PC, with something else, whether these users are interested in different kinds of hobbies, where they are based in the world, what kind of cereal do they eat in the morning. You can target your ads based on what kind of beer they drink. You can target it based on how much money they make, what kind of credit cards they carry, how many babies do they have, are they expecting a new child anytime soon, and so on. And these kind of targeting mechanisms are the background why we got new legislation here in Europe earlier this year. It's easy to get outraged by these massively large Silicon Valley companies which have an extraordinary level of access to us and to our private data because we, we let them, because we volunteer our information to them. It is quite surprising that, for example, here in Finland, People seem to be all too happy to pass on all of their private information to a company somewhere in California. The kind of information they wouldn't give to any company or any official here locally. Back then, when we were still living in caves amongst our tribes, when we had deep and troubling questions, we would go to the wise old men in the tribe to ask our questions. Or maybe we would ask our questions from God. But today when we have deep and troubling questions, we don't ask them from God. We ask them from something else that starts with a G. And this is true. People ask really private questions from search engines. Well from Google, should I tell my wife I'm cheating? That's the type of things people type to Google. The kind of questions they wouldn't dare to ask from anyone. They will ask from Google. Now GDPR has been in effect since May. Um, one of the more obvious 
outcomes for internet users out of GDPR was that hmm, suddenly some of the sites I used to use no longer, no longer let me use them. This was the let's fix GDPR by blocking European users solution that many American sites started using. They were worried about big fines and they didn't feel like fixing any of their problems so they just started doing IP blocking. Companies like, let's take an example, Unroll.me, an anti-spam service run from the United States. You set up this service and it will automatically go through your email inbox and get rid of spam and automatically unsubscribe you or unroll you from mailing lists that you don't actually read. Sounds like a neat service. Sounds like a useful thing to have. And best of all, it's free. Nice. Well, bad news, you can't use it anymore. Since GDPR came into effect, they have blocked European users. Which is great news. It's excellent that European users cannot use unroll.me. I love it. Why? Well, because the way this particular service was making money, because after all, they do have to make money, the way they were making money was that they were going through your inbox, searching for stuff they could sell, and then they sold it. So, for example, they would go through their user's inbox, searching for receipts from the Lyft taxi service, which is the number one competitor to Uber, and then they would sell these receipts to Uber. And this is bullshit. So it's great that they're now blocking European users. I love it. So GDPR, well, here it worked. We got rid of a service people shouldn't be using to begin with. And when we look at how these, these challenges or problems change, one of the key things happening around us right now is that all this data which is being collected about us might not just be collected by computers and by online services. Because we are very quickly entering the bright new world of Internet of Things. Pay attention to this clip. That's a nuclear reactor going critical. Why am I showing you a clip of a nuclear reactor going critical? Well, because this nuclear reactor is being controlled by a computer. Of course it is. This is a typical example of ICS gear, industrial control services, which is all controlled by computers. All factories are controlled by computers. The IoT revolution started from ICS. And first ICS computer implement implementations were already done in the 1970s. And when people think about IoT, they think about consumer goods, like, you know, smart fridges or smart microwave ovens or smart coffee machines. And the fact is that everything is going online. Everything is becoming a computer. Every, everything will be on the internet. Everything will be on the internet if it uses power. Whatever you connect to electricity grid, you will be connecting to the internet grid. If it uses power, it will be online. Whether it makes sense or not, it will be online, even if it makes no sense. Let me show you an example. This is a smart mattress. Yes, you heard me right. It's a mattress you sleep on, except this one is a smart mattress. So it's a mattress they built. This is a company in Spain where they put uh, sensors inside the mattress, vibration sensors, and then they have a mobile app connected to your bed. And the re reason you use this is that when you are outside of your house, it will detect if your bed is used in a suspicious way. <laughs> so you get measurements and everything right next, right to your, your phone. And I know it looks like a joke, it's not a joke. It is a real company. And of course, it's based in Spain. I'm surprised it's not Spain, it's based in Italy. <laughs> Sorry. 
So yes, everything will be going online. And, and, and the idea people have about smart devices that, you know, you get all these benefits and you get all these new features, but of course we also get new risks. And there actually is a IoT law named after me, the so-called Hyppönen law, which says that whenever something is described as smart, what you should be thinking is vulnerable. So here is a smartphone. Vulnerable phone. Smart watch. Vulnerable watch. Smart car. Smart greet. Smart city. You get my point. Oh, the slides died. Hmm. Well, it's okay. So, smart is vulnerable. That's a very pessimistic law. But it's also true, like when things are offline, like a traditional watch, how do you hack it? Well, you don't. As we connect our gear online, they at least in theory become hackable or accessible to outsiders that you wouldn't want to access them. And when people go and look at a new fridge, today, they have two choices. They can either buy a traditional dumb fridge or a new smart fridge. And there's differences between these connected devices and then the traditional devices. There's lots of differences. First of all, the smart device is more expensive. It's more expensive because there's more features. There's a display, there's an app, you know, there's things you can do with your smart fridge that you cannot do with your traditional fridge. This is the situation right now. And when people learn about different kinds of vulnerabilities and risks in IoT devices, a typical reaction I hear is that I don't like IoT. I'm not going to buy smart devices. My house will not have any IoT at all, and I will be avoiding all these problems. And now what I'm telling them is that, no, you won't. You can't. IoT revolution is happening whether we play part or not. And you will be unable to avoid purchasing IoT gear to your house, no matter what you do. Because right now, manufacturers of consumer goods and consumer electronics, they all realize that data is the new oil. You know, they've gone to a Gartner briefing where they've been told that data is the new oil. And they are like, hmm, data is the new oil. How do we get some of this data? Hmm? Well, we have all these microwave ovens and fridges we sell to people. Some of them bring home data, the smart ones, the more expensive ones bring home data. But majority of the things we sell are these traditional devices which bring home no data. So how could we make them send us data, this new oil as well? Well, we could, we could put in a chip, but we can't because it's too expensive. Right now, adding IoT connectivity functionality to a fridge or a washing machine costs something like 10, 15, 20 euros, the chipset costs and connectivity costs. And if you're selling a toaster, which costs 20 euros to begin with, you cannot add 20 euros worth of gear to make it con connect to the internet. So they can't. However, in 10 years, they can. In 10 years or 15 years, the price of the IoT chipset and the connectivity gear will be five cents or two cents or one cent. And when it's cheap enough, everything will go online. Which means in 15 years, when you go buying a new fridge, you still have two choices. You have the smart fridge with the screen, with the app, and then you have the traditional fridge. But even the traditional fridge is online. Because the manufacturer wants to know where you are. The manufacturer wants to know how do you use the product? How often do they have problems with the products? They want to know how many customers they have in Helsinki. They want to know how many customers they have on the east side of Helsinki and how many on the west side of Helsinki. And if there's less customers on the east side of Helsinki, let's advertise more on the east side of Helsinki. This is valuable data. 
It's not very valuable for, for one single consumer, but it's probably more valuable than the price of the chipset if the chipset costs five cents. And as people realize this, when they realize that in the future, even the things that don't look smart will be going to the internet, then the next reaction I hear is that I don't like that. I'm, I'm going to block it. I'm not, not gonna, going to let it co connect to the internet. I'll block it at my router. I'll block it at my Wi-Fi. And what I tell them is that you can't. Because it's not going to be using your router. It's not going to be using your Wi-Fi to go to the internet. It's going to be using 5G. It's going to be using LTEM. It's going to be using one of the new Zigbee protocols. You can't block it. You don't even know it's going to the internet. It doesn't use any of your infrastructure going to the internet. From the point of view of the manufacturer, you don't need to know that it's going to the internet. Everything will be connected. And if everything is online all the time, then we face an interesting problem, which is that how do these physical things, physical products fail when the internet fails? Because sometimes internet fails. And we got a fairly interesting look into that um, around 12 months ago when Amazon had a connectivity issue with their S3 cloud storage system. Amazon's cloud storage system was down for several hours in the middle of business hours here in Europe. And I spent those hours on Twitter, searching for people who were complaining about things that didn't work. Like Amazon is down, what doesn't work? Well, it was mostly like websites or mobile games or different mobile apps that didn't work because Amazon was down. But then there was this one guy who was explaining that he was making food when Amazon went down. And now he can't turn off his oven. I can't turn off my oven because Amazon is down. Now that's unexpected. That's, that's actually quite interesting. Like how do we fail? When internet goes down, do we fail open? Do we fail closed? Do we fail safe? Do we fail unsafe? And one of the root causes for the different kind of issues, both privacy and security issues we have with connected devices and with the fact that everything is going connected, is a problem that we've known from the past. Many of you will remember these. This is a VHS video recorder. We used to have these in every living room. You would go to your friend's house and in the living room they would have big ass CRT TV and underneath that they would have a VHS tape player. Everybody had this. And whenever you would go to anybody's house, if you would look at the display of the VHS player, they would all show the same thing. Every single VHS player on the planet was blinking 12 o'clock. Now, why? Why were they blinking 12 o'clock? What's, what's the point of this? Well, when you buy a VHS player, when you bought one of these in the 1980s and you plucked it in the wall, it didn't know what time it is. So it expected you to go and read the manual. Because on page 80 in the manual, it would explain to you how to set the time. And no one ever did. That's why they were all blinking 12 o'clock. And by the way, I gave this example last month in a talk in, in Brussels. And one guy in the audience said that he actually set up the time in his VHS player in 1980s. And I asked him that, are you from Germany? <laughs> and he was. <laughs> and this is what we do today with our IoT gear. We go and buy a brand new IoT security camera for our summer cottage. We purchase it, we unbox it, we get it out. 
We screw it on the wall, we set up the app, we pair the phone with the camera, and it works, it works. I'm getting the video, hey, excellent. No, don't touch it, don't change anything. You might break something. This is what we do. We never configure the damn thing. We never read the manual. The manual would explain to us how to set up remote access passwords, how to segment your network so the public net only gets the stream from the video but doesn't get the configuration options from the public internet. It would tell us how to safeguard it, but we never do that. We leave it blinking, just like we left our VHS players in the 1980s. And if everything is becoming a computer, it applies to all parts of our lives, like cars. Cars are data centers on four wheels. And when people think about risks, security risks or privacy risks related to cars, they immediately get these horrible ideas of you know, evil hackers disabling my brakes and driving me off a cliff. And that's what we call a movie plot threat. It's, it's an attack which technically is doable. Yes, you could do that. You could disable the brakes. Yes, hackers could drive you off a cliff. But they won't. Because that's the kind of stuff that happens in the movies. But it doesn't happen in the real world. It happens in movies like Fast and Furious. The part of the plot in the, last, uh, in the last installation of the Fast and Furious movies is about using cars as weapons. Hacking them remotely and using them as weapons. I'm sorry if this is a... a uh, if I'm ruining the plot of the movie to some of you, but it doesn't matter because it's not a very good movie. <laughs> so this is not going to happen in the real world. It could. Technically, you could do something like this, but we're not going to see this. Instead, what we will be seeing from evil car hackers are attacks that actually make sense. Attacks like this. This is not a movie. This is CCTV footage from United Kingdom from somebody's home, his home yard. And these are car thieves trying to steal his BMW. They are able to remotely open his doors from their laptop out of the view but once they get in, they can't start the car because they don't have the keys. So what they do is that one of the guys go in the car without the key. He's just pressing the button to start the car. It won't without the key. But the other guy is using an antenna. And both of these guys have a transponder in their pocket. And the guy with the square antenna is trying to find if the keys to the BMW are somewhere in the house, maybe on the kitchen table. And it's, in fact, they are. The car starts and they drive away. This is what car hacking looks like for real. And this makes sense. We already have a big problem with car theft gangs. If those gangs could steal cars without breaking windows and hot wiring the cars by using hacking, of course they would rather do that. And let me make a forecast. One day, someone, somewhere, is going to turn a self-driving car into a self-stealing car. You wake up in the morning to realize your car has driven off. And it's already on a boat on its way to Poland. So, when we look at the changes we're about to face, many of them have to do with the companies that control us. Many of them have to do with the cloud. So this is what the cloud looks like. Take a close look. No, I'm not referring to the clouds in the sky. I'm referring to the data center underneath it. This is the closest Google data center from here, this is in Hamina, an hour and a half from here to east. This is where our data is. This is where our memories are. This is where the pictures of our children growing up are. This is where all the YouTube videos are. This is where the information about who we have a crush on 
is. This place knows where we've been, it can guess where we're going, it knows who we spend time with, it knows what we talk about with them. And I love Google. Great services, great people. I have several friends who work at Google. They hire some of the best minds on the planet. And that's actually a little bit uncomfortable thought. That the best minds on the planet are working for an ad agency. Because that's what Google is. It's not a search engine, it's not a cloud storage platform, it's an ad agency. The biggest ad agency on the planet. Great products, I absolutely love them. No wonder they have good products because they have so, so good people. I just wish I could pay for their products with money instead of my data. And I've told this to Google multiple times. Last time I was having a meeting with them was in, in June. So all these services Google produces, they used to be that the only way you could pay was by letting them track you, letting them collect data from you and letting them violate your privacy. And by the way, don't wait for the video to start, it's a GIF. My favorite GIF to send to someone, they wait forever, like, you know, it's <laughs> buffering. So, I was actually pleasantly surprised last month when uh, someone sent me a link to a funny cat video on YouTube and I clicked the link and uh, I, I, what I found was that Google was actually offering me to, to pay for it, to pay for the service, 12 euros, 12 euros a month for YouTube. Hmm. Wow, well this was exactly what I was asking for, right? That's what I was asking for, that I would rather pay with money than paying with my data. 12 euros a month, that's like $14 a month, $15 a month. Not cheap, but then again, I, 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 pay, I, I pay 10 euros a month for Spotify. Not a bad deal. But of course, the devil, devil is in the details. Because even if you start paying, they will still track you. So going back to the game of African Tahti, where we would stand up with my six-year-old friends and we would shout, Rahat tai henki. What this actually is, is Rahat ja henki. Give me your money and give me your life. They want both. Both the money and the data. There is no option to opt out. So, this website, website number 16 in Finland, back then in 1994, was being run from this machine. It's a 486DX 33 megahertz with 40 megabyte hard drive. It was pretty powerful for its time. I mean, it was powerful enough to run a website, but by today's standards, it's pretty rid ridiculous how slow this thing is. So I wonder just how small this computer would be today with today's technology. And the answer is, it would be the size of this. This is a pile of salt. You'll see grains of salt. And on top of those grains, you'll see a black dot. That's an IBM chipset, which they introduced in February, which is roughly the same speed and power as the computer which was running our website. This is the future of the web. Everything is becoming cheaper and cheaper. Everything is becoming smaller and smaller. And it's up to us to protect this future web. So for that, I wish you good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs>